Hello people, how you doing? Welcome to another episode of Hot Knives House live music production session. And I'm quite excited about tonight because I don't even know what's going to happen, to be honest. Normally I start these things with a script or I'll have an idea, maybe going to do a song, work on something. But no, tonight we're going to build a song from the ground up and I've not followed with any templates or anything like that just because I really wanted to show you how it works getting a track off the ground absolutely from ground zero. But anyway, over on the chat here, make sure you say hello tonight, people. Just going to put on my little uh, first message there. There we go. Yo says G-Man at Hot Nice House. It's a fantastic night outside. Very warm, very warm here in Glasgow. I do have all my fans on, so I've got a wee bit of a noise gate that should be stopping any of that fan noise. Let me show you. I used to work in a studio and next door there was three death metal bands that shared the room and the noise through the walls was, yeah, well basically it ended up I couldn't use the room because you know you're trying to record an acoustic act and there's a rumble through of triggered bass drums through a PA from next door. But one thing it did make me an expert at was using a noise gate to try and filter out whatever's happening in the background, whatever drones. So noise gates, yeah. Great things to have, not just for Tom Toms on drums, by the way. But if I show you this without the gate, you'll probably hear. There we go. See all that noise. And there we go. There we go. So every time I talk, the noise gate opens up slightly. We've got a wee bit of hiss there. But anyway, like I said, we're going to build a track from the ground up. How do we do that? Well, let me tell you. If I just go over to my screen here. There we go, that's us, yes, and we are, as always, in Logic 10. As I tell you every time, Logic isn't Logic 10 isn't necessarily the one that I always use to make music. Um, it's more for demonstration purposes like we're doing this, because OBS, the program that I stream from, needs to use a la uh, the latest version of the Mac software, and my old Logic 9 that I prefer doesn't work with the latest version of OS X. It's these bottleneck problems that Apple creates for you to insist that you buy the latest product. Product, But I will not. I refuse. Anyway, so we're going to start off a track now. Everything's always got a slight disco vibe when I start making music. I think it's just something that kind of happens as part of the, the whole hot knife thing. I'm very much a fan of disco music and it also allows me to get my guitar on. So if I was starting off writing a track, I mean... I'll just plug in here. There we go. Should be getting that there. No. Yeah, if I was starting off, maybe start off by um, throwing in a riff, say. Uh, let's go for something kind of chic influence. So it's probably going to be about 120 beats per minute. So. Yeah. Normally when it comes to writing a song, at first I'm kind of scrambling about thinking, what do I want to do? Is it a disco song? Is it a more kind of electronic type song? You know, but often it's just wherever it takes you. You know, if you pick up your instrument, if you go to a synth, if you go to a guitar and you suddenly come out with a riff and you like it, then just go with it. You know, I don't think you should limit yourself specifically to writing them in the one genre to start with, because often these things, you know, they take their own path and ultimately turn out. Uh, in a way sometimes better than what you initially expected. So, now guitar, guitar's always very good for kind of funky rhythms and stuff, but I think more or less the bass is what takes the lead in any kind of dance music, I would say. So, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to start off, I'm going to get a beat now. Yeah, I can make beats from the ground up, no problem. I mean, if I go into the ultra beat here, this is the Logic in-house drum machine. Quite a good little unit. It's a good way to start off making a track often, but um, equally as easy as just using samples, okay? Samples from the absolute ground up, you know? Uh, oh, sorry, samples that are, are, have been prefabricated, sorry. When you're using a, a drum machine, that's more like building the rhythm from the ground up. Often you can get a good swing, a good feel off of a loop that you maybe wouldn't otherwise get if you're programming in the drums yourself, but we're going to do both, okay? So first off, I always like to go for a kind of 909 bass sound. Now, the 909 drum kit sound, like I say, this is really everything. It's uh, pretty much dance music, I would say. 
all based on these sounds, the rim shot, the snare, the clap, other snare. You can hear a million dance build-ups in that sound, you know. So this is really, it's going to provide a lot of the sounds, a lot of the bass drums, for instance, you know, hi-hats. You can get the hi-hat, there we go. All these sounds, you recognise these sounds from a million different records because it really is everything in dance music, the 909. So I'm going to keep that there on the channel strip. What I do have here in front of me, guys, just in case you're wondering, you know, I've not started off with any real plugins or anything. I've just got something for the guitar. For the bass, that is. We've got a bass amp uh, plug-in here in Logic. Logic's very good. I think Logic is a, is a complete solution for producing music is great because uh, it's got lots of useful plugins. Like I say, um, Pro Tools, uh, what's always put me off, I don't know if it's the same now, it's just the fact that you need to buy a lot of extra plugins to make the thing work, and really Logic comes as a complete solution, which is one of the reasons I really like it. And tonight, I'm not using any of my third-party plugins either, I'm just going to use everything straight off of Logic, so... Yeah, that's a kind of Ampeg type bass sound, but that's ideal for what we need. Anyway, so, yeah, that's one of the channels that I've already put up there. The reason why I kind of started with that is because I ended up with a wild feedback loop when I was trying it out the other day, and I don't want to kind of accidentally do that in the middle of a stream. It made me look even less professional. We can't have that. So anyway, so the other channel strip that I've got up here is for the guitar. Let's see what kind of sound we've got in here. By the looks of things, it'll be some kind of... Um, um, Vox type pattern. Now, where did I put my only remaining plectrum? And that's no lie because I've ran out of about 100 recently. So, yeah, the guitar here, got the guitar and the bass already lined up. That's the only two channels I've really set up so far because they will come into play. We will get the guitar out. Like I say, I'm building a track just entirely from the ground up. So, if you're on the chat here, guys, say hello, make some suggestions, get involved. Yeah, so they'll find the Stratocaster, always a favourite, always gets used for recording, more so than any other guitar that I own. Anyway, right, so like I said, we can build a track from the ground up. Now, if I'm doing something kind of disco and I feel this track, uh, disco is where I'm kind of comfortable, to be honest. It's one of my favourite genres to produce in, so yeah, I like to start off with sample. Now, I do use Splice here, and uh, the Splice, uh, a lot of musicians I've heard talking about you know, or should I say, producers saying, oh, you should make up your own loops from the start, blah, blah, blah. Yes, that's absolutely true. I mean, it's good to have a knowledge of doing that. But if you're ultimately going to come out with results similar to what you're going to get in a sample, i.e. a kind of swingy drum loop or something kind of disco flavoured, then why not just use that prefabricated sample? Doesn't it make you any less of a producer? Ultimately, it just saves you a bit of time. And no one's ever going to question it anyway. As I always say, does the dance floor care? Because if the dance floor doesn't care then neither should you, okay? So the, one of my favourite disco drum loops that I use a lot of here, I go in, just drums, grooves. Yeah, this one here, this provides a foundation for a lot of hot knife tracks, and it's going to provide another one tonight. Here we go, check this. Yeah, so that's a good, good live kind of feeling drum loop there. And that's just a, just a classic... Drum beat, and it's 122 beats per minute as well. 122 is absolutely where I am comfortable. For some reason, it just seems to be the, the magic spot with making music. A lot of uh, house music is at 126, but for me, I like a kinda just a wee bit more groove in it. Not as slow as 120, where just 120 as in you know the, the standard disco pace. Just a wee bit faster, but not as fast as house music. Now, I'm just setting up another channel here so, da, 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 record using the microphone or line input. Wait a minute here. I need to be careful with this. Like I say, the danger of me creating a wild feedback loop for the way I've got this hooked up. So, anyway, I can use this channel here to drop in our drum loop. Like I say, I'm on Spice here. I'm using a drum loop that I'm quite f fond of and seem to use in quite a lot of tracks, to be honest. If I can download the thing. There we go. There we go. I'm actually operating a different system here. I need to actually download Splice onto this operating system. Anyway, scrap that a second. We'll come back to this. So the other foundation that I'm talking about of any drum track, or sorry, of any track, is the drums. So if I'm going to put on a little... Um, yeah. 
I'm going to build a drum loop here. So we're going to take the pace to, like I said, about 122. There we go. So, start off with a kind of classic. You can't go wrong with a 909 kick. Now that's going to be on every beat of the bar, okay? So I hope you can see what I'm doing here. If not, I'll just make it a bit bigger. Right. So this piano roll here, this is controlling all the drums, obviously, on the ultra beat, which is the Logic in-house plug-in. There we go. So, yes, I want to create a note. Yep, there we go. So, and I'm going to put that in at the start of every bar. Okay, write it in like so. Yes. Of the way it's asking me if I want to create a note. Of course I do. And there we go again. So that's it on every beat of the bar. Now I'll take that click off there. Can't go wrong. That is the classic basic formula for a dance record, okay? Four 909 bass drums. What I'm going to do as well with that sound, I'm going to adjust that velocity, so I just bring up the actual volume of that a bit. I like to normally have most of these sounds hitting quite hard to begin with. Um, I just like more banging stuff, to be honest, so I always like hard-hitting sounds. Here we go. Yep. So that is the foundation, obviously, for any dance record, like I say. And we're going to maybe put in a wee drum loop in a second, just once I've downloaded this. Done with the install. Yes, there we go. Right. Fantastic. That's good to know. We're in. We're into the mainframe now. How unorganised of me not to have downloaded Splice on at this side of my computer. Who cares? Forgive me. Anyway, so like I say, the drum loop I like to always use in these kind of tracks, like disco flavour, 122 beats per minute. Uh, now, where are we here? Drums, grooves. Yeah. Like I say, I'm a big fan of this Splice. It's just a very easy interface. In the past, when I used to go and buy samples, uh, I remember a shop called Turnkey in London, the Soho Soundhouse. This shop used to be known as Selma Music Store in the in the sixties and seventies. That's where all the kind of big, famous guitar players like Hendrix, Clapton, you know, Paul Kossoff. That's where they all bought their instruments. Very well known hub of music. But uh, for a while, they had a kind of electronic music bit in there, and it was a sample database. And what it was was a bunch of sample CDs, almost in a kind of jukebox, and you had to go through and look on an interface. All right, that's a kind of Steve Smith drum sample. Right, I'll scroll to that then. All right, and check out a couple of samples and decide whether you wanted to spend about 50 quid on a sample CD, something like that. It was a very long, laborious process, going through all these different CDs, then eventually getting a CD that you maybe used four or five samples from, so it was never an ideal system. And always I was creating stuff from the ground up for that reason, but... Like I say, splices are kind of all-you-can-eat type, you know, 100 credits a month, you got 100 samples a month for about £7, don't know what that is in dollars, but that really, I would say, streamlines the process for getting things going quick, you know what I mean? Workflow is important, sometimes you're buzzing with an idea, but that doesn't last forever, and if you're getting bogged down and sorting out drum loops, it can really mess the creative process, you can end up feeling that, you know, you're not getting anywhere, so often getting some loops just to start is a good way, I would say, of getting the thing off the ground. And these things grow arms and legs and take on their own life anyway. So starting with someone else's uh, prefabricated sound, who cares, man? Certainly not me. Anyway, right, so here's the loop I like to use all the time. Open spline. Yes, indeed. Anyway, yeah, so like I say, this drum loop, the bloody thing of downloads, damn you Splice, how dare you affront me live on a streaming cast on Twitch TV, it's alright man, I've not got hundreds of viewers here anyway, but if you are, and if you have just tuned in by the way, we are building a track from scratch, okay, so, Yeah, come back to that in a second. So, anyway, we'll start off maybe putting in a funky bass line. What I'm going to do, I'm going to copy that bass drum out just for a good number of times there. Love that fan, pardon me, effect that Logic has. Works a treat. Write one bar, then copy the whole thing out. Fantastic. So, go to the bass. Let's see what we got. 
Yeah. So if I put on that bass drum in the background there, I'll just start jamming around. Now the idea, the initial idea for a song, I always like to think you get some kind of hook. You know, it needs to be something that grabs you for a start. I would like to, I mean, start my bass line's good because the bass line is really the dance factor in whatever you do. So if we start off a song here, bit of bass, bit of bass drum, just a jam, see what comes out. I'm looking for something quite kind of funky, something that can ultimately be used. And uh, aye, we can make it into tonight's song, whatever that song may be. Here we go. That's alright. Yeah, that's not bad. Straight first line, just straight off the cuff, so. Quite Motowny though, so I'm thinking of something. I want something maybe moves a wee bit more, something a wee bit, yeah, more pumping. Okay, I like a live bass, a live bass line house track, but let's give it something a wee, just a wee bit more banging. I would say, yeah. More kind of staccato. I've got a wee idea for a rough come. Yeah. Maybe take it down a bit though. Uh, maybe a wee bit higher, so. A, I always like A. A is a good key. When I'm playing the bass, A pretty much sits in the middle of the neck, as it does with guitar. Okay, so I mean, something about... That's a good start, man. I quite like that. I think I'll probably just run with that. You know. So we're at 122. I maybe even actually push the boat out and go right up to 126. Yeah. Something a bit faster. Yeah, it's one thing to note there, but I'm playing the bass, um, I, I would say all kind of, you know, music that's based in black music styles, like kind of, you know, anything that comes from, you know, the obvious one being disco, but funk, R&B, soul, all these types of music are always, it's a kind of, there's a looseness to the playing, it's almost like you're slightly behind the beat, and if I really exaggerate this when I'm playing it, you'll see what I mean. It's kind of just, it's almost to sit in the pocket, as they call you, just a ball here, ball here, 
good Scottish term that, or a midges ball here, which is even less than a ball here. I'll tell you about that in another uh, stream. But anyway, right, yeah, so you're always sitting a bit behind the beat. It's almost like being, as George Clinton said, loose yet together at the same time. So you, you rock music and kind of white music styles, I would say you're generally pushing the beat of that kind of energy to the sound. But anything that's groove based, feel based, you always want to play a wee bit behind the beat, okay? So here we go. So let's just go for that kind of riff again. I think that last loop I quite like there. What I'm really looking for when I do that is a good loop, something that's going to provide the basis of the track. Basis, no pun intended. Or maybe it was just my crap sense of humour. But anyway, yeah. I'll put this loop up here now. Let's see what's with guards. Yeah. Unmute my guitar. There we go. Yeah, so at the moment it sounded a wee bit scrappy, that. A lot of fret noise, a lot of string noise in that bass. Channel EQ. This is the channel EQ they give you on the bass sound, but I would say, see if I can put a spike up there. About a, a thousand hertz. Yeah, yeah. You just go through to it. I mean, I find, see, with anything I do frequency-wise, I just kind of jack up one frequency there on the, in the queue, and then I, I kind of um, go through the frequencies, sweep through the frequencies to, to see what's really annoying me in there, and then I kind of pull it down from there. It's something I do any time in the studio and I get a new customer, and they kind of, oh, no, what are you doing? You know, when I put up this frequency, and make it sound a lot worse, but that's the idea, getting a queue, a kind of spike on whatever frequency you got there. And just kind of going through and finding where that annoying frequency is. The one I'm looking for here is that kind of string noise, kind of clatter, kind of sound. Listen, listen. Yeah, right there is going to... You're always going to find annoying frequencies from 2.5 to 3.5k. It's just where all the screechy nail stuff happens. Yeah. I mean, if I go into the analyzer... You can actually see, I mean, yeah, we are right on the frequency. Okay, so that bass sounds all right at the moment, but anything I do, dance music-wise, especially if you're mixing in organic music within electronic music, what you're going to find is that there's always going to be like a, a need to compress the hell out of things because anything in electronic music is always generally using the same samples. And then what happens is um, basically those samples uh, are, are hitting the speakers at the same velocity every time. So it doesn't really create any kind of uh, variation in dynamics. So when you're putting organic instruments in, you need to make sure they're quite dynamicless as well. So I really compress the shit out of anything that I put in here. Now let's see what we got here on the bass. Still a wee bit of EQ, I'd say. I get used to what I'm looking for uh, EQ wise because I do it all the time, but still, you just got to sweep through the frequencies and find out what EQ and what frequencies are on you. I find around 200 hertz is always a horrible frequency to be had. Bob Rock himself said that. As in Bob Rock that produced all Metallica albums, he says, you know, 200 hertz, what a horrible frequency. Why would you do that to music? Interesting. But anyway, so I've sorted out the frequencies a bit now. There's a compressor already on this. I think, yeah, now that is actually just a kind of, you know, a channel strip that's already there, which kind of makes things a wee bit easier. And to be honest, a lot of these things are quite good, man. They're ultimately kind of um, getting rid of the job of the producer, as we know it, bit by bit, because I think more and more software and the kind of things are set up to make things really easy and to get a really good sound easy. Years and years ago, it was impossible to get a good sound. You had to go to a studio to get a good sound. Now you can get a good sound in your own house, you know what I mean? From a laptop, you know? 
from probably you know a Dell laptop with software you probably didn't even pay for in some cases, you know, but you can still make great sounding records, and that's one of the good things about technology. With digital technology is causing a lot of problems for the record industry, for the creative side of things. You've all, you've got a lot more options, I would say, you know, because you can do all this in your house pretty much, you know. So, like I said, these kind of preset bass patches that'll do. Now get that bass drum back in them. Now, this is something when you put in a bass drum in a track. You need to make sure the bass drum's actually in tune because that bass is an A, right? But if, if there's a tone coming off of that bass drum, which there is, if I crank it right up just to make it really. Oh, there's a root note there. So, what note is that? Now, I normally go to my mini, my little piano app on here and just check it. I think that's a. Yeah, that seems to be like a an A flat, an A flat bass drum. We don't want an A flat bass drum. We're an A, so we need to really have it. Let's see, can we tune this bass drum? There we go. Yeah. Ultra beat, quite good, man. I quite enjoy it. I've always thought it works. Does its job. Oops. It would tell me it was in C, but I don't believe it. That would be an A. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, but like I say, make sure your bass drums are in tune. If your bass drums are out of tune, you're going to stick it on the club one day and the song will suddenly sound kind of weird because the bass drum's out of tune. A lot of times you don't really get much chance to, to hear the bass in a small room. That's why you should maybe get it cranked on someone else's system maybe if a mate's got a club night or whatever you know get him to put it on before they get everyone in the room or even just use your own speakers but go and stand outside the room because when you stand outside the room or your studio you'll actually hear a bit of bass as well depending on how the room's set up of course thankfully in my studio i've got quite a number of uh, speakers around the place this is only the top floor at the moment when i'm broadcasting from uh, downstairs i've got 18 inch subs and things like that so it's, i can always check the bass but bass is easily messed up because bass waves take about 10 foot to form so if you walk 10 foot back from your speakers you'll hear things totally different from the way you actually hear things sitting in front of your speakers it's always worth checking that because bass obviously very important i do get sent a lot of things to remaster and remix i'll get out of tune bass drums so it's always watch out for that make sure the bass drum is in tune right so that tells me it's hitting an a here this is the problem Often you get notes that are too high and too low at the same time. How do you get around that? Well, change the pitch of the song, I'd say. It's like the key of C. The key of C is always a bit low and subs and a bit too high when I put up the octave. So often, yeah, I like between G and A, it's normally quite a good key. Somewhere between E and A, in fact, probably a kind of, you know, best sounding notes, I would say, a wee production tip for you there. Anyway. Yeah, okay, right, so everything's going to happen in eight bar sections. Now, I'm just going to very quickly mock this up and show you what I normally do. But anything in really dance music, especially house music, for me, happens in eight bar sections. If you're doing a radio edit of a song, often you need to kind of take out bars here, there, and everywhere to make it fit in with that three minutes and 30 seconds that they expect of you. But in the case of this, we'll just treat it as a house song, you know, something that you can basically kind of build up as it chooses. And then, like I say, if we're doing it, and we're doing it um, eight bars at a time. It just picks up the song a wee bit every every kind of what well, every eight bars, obviously. So at this point, we're now going to add in a, a hi hat and offbeat. This is very basic stuff, man. We're going to put in loops around this, but this will always happen in the background in a dance song anyway. So yeah, just a kind of conservative hi hat kind of. Before I do that though, bass is still sounding a wee bit muddy. Anything around 300 to 500 hertz is a bit of a horrible sound. Have a listen. Ah, that kind of hollow kind of sound. Just tightens the bass up a wee bit. Around 120 as well. Can, yeah, there we go. 
hellish. That kind of horrible frequency in there. Also take quite a bit of the bass off. It's good to tighten up the bass a bit. People think you want a louder, fatter, heavier track, etc. But often, by tightening up the bass a bit and taking a bit of the frequency out of the bass, then what you're getting is a tighter bass sound. You know, it's another thing you can't really tell if you're mixing in small speakers because, you know, you maybe crank up the bass and you, you, the speakers you're using don't really reproduce that bass sound. So you're not hearing it the way it should be. And then, like I say, you get it playing the club night or something. You're like, what the hell is going on there? So anyway, right, sculpted a bit of the bass frequency off of the bass. I've got quite an aggressive kind of compressor sound. This is just the end. I'm going to change the compressor sound. Yeah, I like the VCA sound on this uh, in-house Logic compressor. Quite tight. A lot tighter than, say, like what the other one I had on there. Good. Yeah. But I muffled that for the bass. Yeah, a bit tighter that vintage VCA voltage controlled amplifier that stands for, by the way, guys. Anyway, yeah, but it just makes it a wee bit nicer sound there. Take time and mess around with your compressors and stuff. What I normally like to do is put the effect on full blast, hear exactly what it does when it's on full, and then pair everything back to there. And that's a good way to get to know different compressor settings. Put it on, crank up all the settings, and see how it reacts, you know, when it's full blast, then pair back from there. But anyway. So we got that sound a wee bit sweeter. Big dirty click in that because we've looped it. Now I need to switch that, give me just a second, guys. Yeah. You fade to. There we go. We fade to grey. Yes. Now what happened there? The reason why I was getting a big click is because anytime you loop a bit of music, if it's not cut right in the zero point of the, the sample, I'll show you what I mean, guys. If you look here, see right here, that's the zero point of a sample because there's nothing up or down. If you if I cut right in the middle there, like you can see that, that's where the problem, that's why it was clicking there because it was halfway through a zero point. Anytime you're cutting your samples, make sure you're right on the zero point here, okay? Just makes the whole thing sound a lot smoother. I hate getting stuff and it's full of clicks, man. I get it quite a lot and it's a real horrible sound. It's something that only gets louder when you master as well, so... So here we go. Now already in the master output there, if you can see that there, it was overloading a bit, and it's also going to sound a wee bit crunchy at your end, because it's the way I've got my sound card set up, so it's always good to work with a limiter on the end of your chain, okay? Limiter, brick wall limiter as you call it, just stops the sound going past a certain threshold and that's important because digital is a very harsh sound and it's not an easy sound to work with. People talked about, you know, oh, tape saturation and whatnot and the great effects of tape. Tape was lovely. People used to crank up the treble when they put a mix onto tape and it'd come off sounding nicer, it'd come off sounding brighter and they would try and do the same thing when it came out with digital recording and it would just sound hellish because the more, the more treble you have on a, a digital then it, it doesn't react well with it you need to kind of almost sculpt the treble out of a lot of sounds in the digital world to make them sound smooth that's what i've found certainly anyway but by not having a limiter you run the risk of having that trebly thing that you really kind of yeah you know it's not a sound you want to be listening too much it'll fry your ears but anyway right here we go there we go So we got a kind of a... Uh, so that can be treated as one riff. Now that's just going to be a case of pushing and pulling and kind of getting something, you know, really milking every last drop out of that riff, which is what exactly happens in old dance music. You just take the one riff. I mean, I don't really think three riffs is a good place to start for a dance record. So we've got a bass line in there. Um... Maybe I kind of taking it to the bridge type bass line, you know. A classic example of a house song really is Daft Punk's Around the World. I mean, look at that. You get two or three, two, two bass lines effectively. And you can listen to them all day, you know. Both of them are cracking bass lines. So, mentioning Daft Punk Around the World, maybe try something.
Top. Maybe try something. That's quite cool, yeah. A wee bit of the rhythm influence there as well with Daft Punk. Just don't tell anybody. Yeah, uh, you can dangerously get into a wee bit cheesy riff kind of area, which I was doing there, I think, you know, you know. We've all heard these chord changes a zillion times, so I kind of try to stay away from something like that. I mean. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I just think it's somewhere it wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't think it would go. That's still quite a common kind of sequence, but then I'll say the argument is that, you know, familiarity is what makes people like music. If you're writing a song and you do something that's too clever, people often kind of can't tune into it, you know? So if we do something that's maybe got a wee bit more, um, let's say, a wee bit more, uh, yeah, something a wee bit, I mean, I, I was going to say original, that's what I'm thinking about original. You, there's no such thing as originality. That is the problem. You know, anything you do has been done before, but something that's just not done to death. It's probably what we're looking for, so... The first cut, I know, same. Bump, bump, bump. Yeah, here we go. I'll throw something then. I'll come up with something, don't you worry. Here we go. Straight off the head. Run out of bass drum there, put the bass drum back in. Yeah, so I like to just jam these, then we'll kind of slot it in as and where we see fit. Here we go, one more time. Not bad, not bad, just thinking my fingers right now. Here we go again. Let's rock this joint. Quite a difficult bass line now. Always write things I can't play. Aha! Here we go. Thank you. 
there. Okay, so I've got it in there somewhere. Should unplug that. You begin a big crackle. OMG. Anyway, right, so, like I say, what we got here? I'm just going to consolidate this down to one take because I think that last one was good. We are messing with this, so. so I'll just use it on one good loop. Not to say I won't re record this. Look. So I your fingers getting tired there, quite a difficult rough to play. Yeah, bum bum. Yeah, so I'm just gonna cut this. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. We about studio editing. Making up the loop. Now, basically, what I normally do with these parts is I like to play them in first. You know what I mean? Get a few ideas in, and then once I've got an idea, I'll... yeah, once I've got an idea, then I'll play it back in again. So, first off, we've got this bass line. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, that's cool. Then we got the other. There we go. I'm gonna switch out that for another bit that was a wee bit nicer played. That sounds got two kind of bass riffs. Okay, that's a good place to start. I would say. Yeah, so that's how it's got kind of, I mean the bass is the main thing really, a good bass hook, especially with the kind of music I like, if you don't have anything happening in the bass that's interesting, I kind of, I, I'm not as into it, I think, a bass is really the key to all kind of dance music styles, so, yeah. Okay, cool. So basically, right, that's the crux of the song to start off with. We bit of bass, we bit of drums, man. Everything else is kind of secondary to it. The drums, I mean, I, I think the drums really in most dance music is pretty basic, you know? It's the groove and stuff and how we kind of infect that, how we inject that, should I say, um, by using the bass. That That's what really is the crux of all dance songs. Now, I'm going to add a wee bit of guitar in just a second, but I am actually, believe it or not, I'm installing spice, so not spice, splice, I should say, as I go here, because splice is where I ultimately keep a lot of my loops, a lot of the ones that I've downloaded, and I'm just going to get access to them. And uh, loops are going to give us a kind of, you know, a swing to this, something kind of a wee bit funky to put in between the, the, the drum hits, if you like. But as well as that, putting some guitar, so I'm just going to maybe jam a wee bit of guitar on this and see what I come up with. 
And this is how all songs that I do really take effect, really kick off in the first place. We kind of um, just jam away, see what comes out. Something does. If it's something that I like, then I'll run with it. If it's a good riff, in the case of this, I really think it is. It's a wee bit of a wee bit of something to it, something that's made me interested. So anything that makes me interested and want to play, what's the wee look? There is my plectrum, yes. So, let's get a wee jam over this, mate. Make sure I'm in tune. This is one thing that a lot of people seem to forget. Guitar. Guitars aren't in tune because you play a chord and you think it's in tune. The guitar, always check it on a tuner. Anything as well, any kind of, you know, I would say if it's like violins and stuff as well, you want to make sure that these sort of things, you know, are always in tune. Anything you ever put down, organic kind of acoustic instruments, double check the tuning because to try and sort it out laterally is a pain, especially in the guitar. There's a lot of the programs that kind of claim it can help out with it, but they don't always really work in a way just as a good in tune instrument would be in the first place. And even if it's just a guide, you may think that you're just putting a guide on, but when you're playing it, you might like what you've done. And then if it's a wee bit out of tune, you know what I mean? The guide's no use to anybody. So I would say always kind of do your takes, do your kind of guides as if you were the real thing. So anyway, let's tune up. So before we play, let's tune up, as they used to say in all these, uh, in all these guitar tuition videos. Okay, man, cool. Let's see what's with God's. Yeah, right. Here we go. Typical G Man Funk Pattern. Very Pam Mute. Yeah, we've got a different bass line in here. Should have been recording at the same time. Anyway, yes, what is this next bass line? Yeah, anyway, so a little wee bit of jamming on there. I was quite enjoying myself there. It's good to just get a wee bit of organic flavour into it. That's how a lot of these tracks start. So ooh. another thing I like to do. And I think it's like a lot of island reggae type, you know, stuff. They'd always have the bass, uh, uh, kind of a, a palm muted guitar following the bass. So that's one thing that I kind of borrow from Bob Marley and Co. And that's what I'll put down on this track here, so. Try and put down guitar live. I mean, I'll probably spend an hour quite a few takes on that. But just doing it myself, then I'll be playing it. 
a number of times. This will do for the now though. Cool. So that gives us a foundation for a lot of these uh, kind of riffs. Now I want to get maybe something kind of more chordy, more funky as well. So I just get all these elements in first, then I can start really chopping around with them and throwing in lots of other um, dance kind of elements like drum beats and whatnot. And I believe I've just loaded in Splice. How about that, eh? I'm actually uploading, or should I say downloading software and using it as we go. I feel so 21st century right now, I tell you. Let's open up now and splice. Right? Anyway, yes, like I say, so let's get an arc kind of chordy type guitar part in here. Rogers Cookbook. Yeah, getting the chords a wee bit wrong there, but anyway. That initial bit there, that's kind of what I'm looking for, yep. Now, a wee kind of chicken funk bit as well, I like to add in here as well. Now, like I say, I do these a number of takes generally to get something I was really happy with if I'm doing it on, but we don't need to do that tonight because we're just talking you through basically what my process would be for writing, how I start off. So in this case, we have started with a more kind of, um, yeah, a funky kind of bass, okay, which is not a problem. <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to double track that. All these kind of guitar parts like that, that kind of funky kind of... Yeah, all that kind of stuff, man. I really like to hear that getting double tracked because that gives a real nice stereo wash to the sound. So I'm just going to do the same again. I'm going to pan it right this time. Okay, so here we go. You see what I mean? This really fattens up the sound. And I believe it or not, it's the inaccuracies in the, in the double tracking that make it actually fat.
Hey, that's us back online. There we go. Must have blown an amp with those sick beats. Thank you very much, Nox556. There we go. We're back on. I don't even know what happened there. And I'll tell you actually a story. I run this place, a professional recording studio, and, I, and if there's anyone watching that actually comes to my studio, often things just get thrown up by the computer during the day, and you're actually like, what the hell happened there? But I need to kind of talk my way through it and act like, yeah, this this happens before. I know what's happening. But internally, I'm having a wee kind of a cry to myself thinking, what happened there? As I kind of did there, but I went for the good old option of switching on and off the old reboot mechanism, and it's worked fine. So back to the track. Here we go, guys. Panic is over. Yeah. So what I was saying was this kind of guitar effect, this kind of, you can get that if you're hopefully getting that in stereo. Yeah, just creates a real washer sound. I can't go obviously without mentioning Nile Rodgers. That is a real inspiration for these sort of guitar sounds. But before that, like I say, guys in James Brown's band in particular, Jimmy Nolan, you know, very kind of, you know, I'll put on a guitar, I'll show you. Very much that kind of, um, Here we go. Yeah. So J Jimmy Norman would do that kind of, you know, that kind of. The notes last a bit longer, but Nile Rodgers in particular, what he brought to the table is this kind of. That's more kind of muted sound. That. And it's also done with such precision as well by him that. You know what I mean? It makes him stand out for the rest. There's a lot of other people done a similar kind of, you know, style, you know, but not as quite as tight. And for me, really, it's got to be nice and tight when you're doing a kind of, you know, something a funky. If you're doing a kind of a, anything over an electronic beat, for a start, it's got to be right on the beat. You need to make sure that's definitely tight. But at the same time, it needs to be a wee bit behind the beat, which is the essence of funk. So it is a difficult style to play, and I think it's often one of these things you say you either have or you don't. I think it can be learned to an extent, but I know a lot of people that just couldn't get it as well. But anyway, right, so that there. Bum, bum, bum. So I was going to add an our little kind of, an our little bit of guitar here before I start dressing it up with drums. That's the easy bit. It's to get an inspiration, I think, is the difficult bit for people, getting an idea for riffs, getting a place to start from. And I think, see if you can't come up with a riff and you're kind of struggling, why not go on to Splice Lack and keep going back to it, but go on there and find a riff and something that inspires you and starts you because they're all copyright free. It's a good place to start and get an idea. But anyway, right, let's here we go. What have we got? Yeah, we'll take that. Here we go. But here, what do we do on that section? Maybe try something a bit more kind of. Oh, minor nine. Oh, sexy, very sexy. Right, maybe throw that in there. Okay. Yeah, I can already hear that's been quite a banger. Everyone I do is generally quite banging, I would say. I've never been into real kind of laid-back dance music, so 
Yeah, what we got here? And then you make sure I get the right chords, actually. Man, that's quite a quite jazzy vibe. Don't get my fucking hands around it though. <gasps> Shit, man, I fucking swore anyway. What the fuck, Ray? Right, here we go. Yeah, very kind of like jazzy handfuls. Oh, shit. Oh. God. Yeah, indeed. They'll give you RSI, try to play those shapes, but yeah, like big jazzy kind of. Yeah, let's put that down. Here we go. We'll take a few bars before. See what we got. major chord at the end, so I'll just drop that in. Like I say, I spend a lot more time agonising over small details with these things alone. We don't need to bother too much. But I'm crying playing those chord shapes. man cool okay you know what i'm a fussy bastard so i'm just gonna do that again because i need to get a nice good sample then we'll start putting some drums in Maybe do us, you know, um, for that section. I put an guitar part in just while I'm inspired. To what I call a celebration guitar part. You hear why? You know the song Celebration. I'm sure you do. Here we go. Intonations a wee bit on this guitar, or is it just the tuning? Older strings get now. I've got a confession to make this isn't my number one strat, it's my number two strat. What you call a parts caster, it's a bit of a body off of something, neck off something else. Different pickups off different guitars, made pink because I fucking love pink, you might be able to tell. But um, yeah, my other guitar's got a broken string and I didn't replace it in time. Now this guitar as well, the strings are quite old. I would say if you're recording guitar, old strings can make it seem out of tune. The further you go up the neck, it can affect the intonation. And that's actually what's happening here. They're quite old strings in this one. What I find myself doing is bend the one note. Bend it into tune. Or temper tuning it. So I'm basically tuning to what the chord I'm playing. I don't worry too much if I have to just get one chord sounding right. That's the foundation of the track. Might as well just tune to that chord. Let's just check this one. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Celebration! Right. 
that's cool, man. We can work with that at the moment. I'll agonise over the small details later. Thank you if you've just joined us, guys. You are tuned to the G-Man's Hot Knife's House, I should say. No, yeah. Say hello in the chat, guys. Y'all out there? I say yo. Anyway, yeah, we're building the tracks in the ground up here. I don't even know how this is going to turn out, but I'll get a rough idea now. I knew it was always going to be a kind of funky, but yeah. <laughs> Now those guitars are sounding pretty crappy at the moment, sound-wise, okay, so let's just sculpt them a little bit. Yeah, so, starting off with the bass. We've already spent a bit of time getting our bass sound alright, so that's alright. I'm going to group these two guitars together. Okay, what I normally like to do, you see there, I'm gripping the channels together here. We're going to put them to a bus. So the first two buses I've got are reverb and delay sends. Quite important, so we don't worry too much about them. Auxiliary 3, that's going to be guitar. I like to differentiate when I go into my um, channels, the actual group channels I always write with a... Uh, Capital letters, reason being is it helps me differentiate what's a group channel and what's just a, an actual channel channel. Iron Brew gets you through. So, okay, we've got a boxy kind of sound in there, sound I don't like. Put in some EQ here, okay, so. Yeah, we want to avoid that. That's about 800 hertz. A wee bit smoother. We check out the analyzer here. I normally do this by ear. Yeah, I'm not a wee bit that. I just maybe take up the highs a wee bit. Yeah, that sounds nice. Then maybe what I do as well is kind of compress that. I like compressor on everything. It's better. I mean. If you want a nice commercial sound, man, everything's pumped up to the point where it's almost distorting these days and everything you're mastering and guitars, etc. And compressor, man, um, yeah, let's get a wee bit crunchy. You want something right in your face, especially if you're using organic sounds, like I say, against kind of, you know, processed dance music sounds. So I quite like the studio VCA setting. Quite a lot of attitude. Another thing I really like to do as well is use a bit of bit crusher. Bit crusher's great for, you know, taking down the quality of uh, whatever it is you're using. In this case, it downsizes the bit rate. If I put it down to 8 bit, for instance, turn it down for a start so it doesn't blow your ears off. Obviously, you can get real fuzzy, can it? It sounds like an old computer game, but yeah, you don't want it down that low. But what it does is it kind of. For me, it almost emulates the sound of a kind of sampler. Samplers always generally run at 12 bit and they're a very kind of low quality sample sound. But um, yeah, it, it had its own charm and what was limited at the time then become an effect over years. And you know, that kind of slightly crunchier sound, slightly more distorted, I think it's quite a nice sound that makes it sit in its own place in the mix. So a bit of bit crusher, just in small doses. I turn it off there, I turn it on. Just gives a bit more attitude. Yeah, no one end tunes the song. Yeah, so let's hear that sound. Yeah, so that's quite nice. Guitar's quite cutting now. Well, let's see about this uh, bridge section that we're talking about here, okay? Once we've got these kind of foundation sections, we can start laying it out. It's really just a case of building up and tension and release. Yeah, so what I've done is I've put that on in the kind of funky guitar section. What I'm going to do this is... Okay, these two sections are the same, so I'm going to create a, a kind of double track out of this. I'm going to split them in half. 
Yeah, there we go. And then double that and fade one left, hard left, one hard right. And that should give us this kind of effect again that we're double tracking these things. So. Yep. There we go. Beautiful double tracking. Now I'm probably going to put these back through that, rip them through that guitar bus. There we go. So that bus there is the guitar bus. Or maybe I'll give them their own bus because I like a bit of, a bit of, um, I would say a bit of reverb on that kind of spacey guitar type bit. So we're going to call that space guitar. Here we go. Space guitar. And I'll put just a bit of generic reverb on that at the moment. A large hall reverb. There we go. On that setting as well, I'm going to use a bit of compressor. I like that compressor just working away in that guitar. It makes it nice and kind of crunchy, as does the bit crusher. Maybe I'll, I'll take the bit crusher off that kind of eerie fairy guitar bit. Anyway, here we go. Yeah, man. Yeah, man, I'm dancing, that's a good sign. Someone wants to make me move my feet. Then we are in business, okay? So this here, yeah. What I've done here is I basically split up this guitar part and I'm gonna turn this into a double track. Anytime I use guitars, I like to double track them. It just gives a bigger sound, you know, and everyone always comes in and say, oh, can you make me sound bigger? You know what I mean? Like uh, singers, oh, can you make it sound a bit bigger? And really all I mean is just a kind of, you know, either more compressed or double tracked. I think that's the two kind of main ways I would really use to fatten up any sound. So I've turned this into, from this side, there we go. Slight variance there at the end of that double track, but that's fine. Nothing to write home about. Okay, we've got two distinct sections then. So just to remind you what that is, before we start dropping in drums. Yeah, so that bass, that's doubling the bass riff, which is, uh, if I can just find it. So another cheeky way I can use to kind of double track guitar Without, or anything really, in the logic, I use this thing all the time, sample delay, okay, that comes in delay, and what that does is I can basically delay one side a wee bit more than the other, etc, let me just show you if I can make this any bigger, which I can't, see that there, that's it, set quite extreme, so I bring it in a bit, just helps it set a bit wider, what it does is it delays, it splits the sample if you like in the two, and then delays one side as you see fit, as however, however many, milliseconds you want to do it on, okay, so there we go. Yeah. I'll make it a wee bit wider again. Yeah, quite wide. Yeah. There we go. So I'm just gonna tag in what I've got here. It's always important to label your kind of tracks as you go because you end up just swimming in tracks, you don't know what's happening. So bass drum and hi-hat, very, very basic. We're at 126. Try the party over here. <laughs> right, cool. That's sounding pretty good. Yeah, I like that. If I dare say so myself, what are you guys thinking on the chat? Let me know what's happening. Say yo, what he's up to tonight, tell me what's going on. Obviously, you're sitting watching a bit of Hot Knife's House. Thank you very much. But anyway, right, here we go. Like I say, I need some samples. So I want to get something about a groove in there, something that's going to give us some swing to the whole occasion. So we're going to look up here, and hopefully we're going to find my recently downloaded copy of Splice. Yes, fantastic. Here we go. I believe we are in. So... Yeah, here we go. All my downloads. 
Now, I've just basically been through. So, like I say, Spice, fantastic resource just for finding tracks, man. Uh, for finding kind of, you know, grooves, etc. Don't worry too much about what people think. Who cares? It's only about the dance floor things. And they don't really care whether you use a prefabricated drum beat or not. So, right. Where is my disco drum beat? Yeah. 122 beats per minute. It's the thing I like about Splice. You can get, basically set the parameters right on a filter for checking, you know, what kind of feel a track, you know, what feel a sample you want, what genre, etc. That's great. For all the time spent going through sample CDs when I was younger, man. If only I'd had this, man. It would make life so, so much easier. Anyway, right. Okay, so what do I have in the way of disco drums here? 122 beats per minute. Yeah. These are all my samples that I've previously put in. But I tell you what, let's go for something brand spanking new. Okay, we're going to set the parameters here. 126. Yep. I want bass drum. We'll start off maybe with like a... Yeah. If I'm doing a disco track, I don't always like to search within the disco genre for samples. I find it's quite good to kind of stray in and, you know, house music, techno, etc. you know, and see what else we have. So let's just check. See, we'll go, we'll start off a house. House is quite general, yep. Yeah. Want some drums? And, yeah. Search all over. Yeah, so... Uh, so one thing I would say with Splice, as much as it's a good idea, the actual kind of database, their way of searching for things is not particularly easy, guys. Sort it out. But, I can my samples here. Right. Yeah, I believe this is my favourite snare in there, yeah. 126 beats per minute, though. Let's see what we got. Most of your day, you will find you actually are looking for samples and going through different patches and stuff. It's a necessary evil. I'm making it look fast by starting off with doing some other different kind of riffs and whatnot and having things a wee bit uh, quicker to hand by doing bass and guitar loops. But actual going through samples, you will spend a lot of time doing it and it can be pretty boring at times until you get exactly what you're looking for. But you know what it's like when you get that sample that you've been looking for instantly inspired and ready to go unlike this fucking thing ah fuck you splice anyway if this doesn't produce the results we are going from scratch guys right there's me ranting on about how good this was only for it to fuck up on me Yeah, fighting a losing battle here. I'm glad the viewers are sticking with me because I don't have a fucking clue why this hasn't given me what I'm looking for. Splice, fuck you. <laughs> Motherfuckers. Anyway, right, okay. So, back to Apple. Thankfully, Apple does give us our own samples as well. Apple also pretty much uh, harasses me every day with an update they're wanting to give me as well, which I'm not interested in, so don't you worry about that, guys. Right then, so who is on the chat here? Say hello, people. I know you're watching. Hello. Action Crunch. Follow for follow. Okay. Later. Yeah, so here we go. Thankfully, we do have some loops on Apple here. So, let's see what we're going for. Just want some kind of drum loop in the background. Something I can have... Um, Something nice and funky. There we go. All drums, beats. That's not bad. Now 
In an ideal world, that'll drop it in as a 126 beats per minute. See if that can do it. Yeah. The one thing you got to look out for as well, when I've put that loop in there, it's got a kind of skippy kind of vibe to it. If you get a loop that's quite skippy, um, yeah, it can be difficult. If you're mixing two records in, you'll really notice it. If the groove is set a lot different, or the swing of the hi-hats is set different, sometimes you need to make sure everything you put in every sample, if you are using our samples, I've got that similar swing to them, or you need to write it in when you go into the piano roll in any of these uh, instruments. So. so I'll take off that hi-hat one. That's good, man. Liking that, that's good. So that's quite a kind of strong beat. Yes. There we go. Hey, it's a live broadcast after all. Who knows what's going to happen? Not even me as it turns out. Hey, what's going to happen? I'm going to have a can of juice. Is absolutely roasting here in Glasgow, man. Pure sweltering, by the way. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so that's cool, man. Let's lay it out a bit. Let's start adding in the elements and snares and stuff like that. You know, we really want to make sure that we're kind of packing this out. This is probably something I'll do over a couple of weeks, to be honest, because there's so much to add to it. It's not something I can necessarily just break down all into one session. But ultimately... We've got most of the track here. Just for argument's sake at the moment, I am going to put in a snare. Here we go. Snow's a wee bit weak that one, so you want something. Yeah. Probably something I would try an our snare sound on. That ultra beat, maybe a wee bit weak, man. Here we go. If we use something, maybe try something that's not, not as 909. 909's a good sound, man, but the snare, I think there's more use for the bass drum than there is for the snare because the snare's always going to be giving away the fact that it's a 909. The bass drum really kind of works with anything. I think the snare really... Is more an old school type sound. So just purely going into the sounds on uh, Logic here. One of the things I like about this Logic drum machine is you can change the pitch of the samples. 
That's all right, but it's a wee bit weak, I'm thinking. So if I get the sample, I can actually pitch it down in Logic, which I do a lot of. Yeah. Because I've pitched that down, it's also moved the actual um, tempo as well. So not the tempo, the kind of um, the timing of it. So what I really need to do is kind of move that back a bit. Yeah, I would say even moving the whole sample. Just so it starts a bit quicker and stays on time. Because I've pitched it down, it's put it out of tune. And, uh, sorry, out of time as well, but anyway. There we go. Yeah, man. Let me try it. Hello. Dude, all kind of crazy noises. Two things, guys. Right, so. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. You have a wee listen to the track here, guys. Got the basis of, uh, I, I would say, I mean, that, that those two riffs in there are ultimately serious. So, all we need to do is kind of tease them out a bit, add in drums and whatnot, and basically make it a bit more pad it out if you like. Because often dance music, you're only using a couple of riffs to really uh, to sell the thing, you know. Maybe I can have top line on that or something, I could say to T, put a kind of extra vocal hook, etc. So, we go for the moment, what we've got is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Okay. So, I'm going to give you one more chance. You're getting one more chance, Mr. Splice. Like I say, this is where we're going to download our loops from. But potentially what I'm going to do is split this up over a couple of weeks, guys. And then...
Hey! Indeed, sound cards. A whole wonderful wealth of problems associated with anything with a USB connection, I think. Always fucks up on you at some point. But anyway, yeah, so we're talking about putting in tops. Yeah, that's quite a good top, Riff. So like I say, it just adds a bit of swing to the whole thing. So I'm going to drop this back in. Like I say, directly from Spice. Splice, I should say. All downloads, here we go. Yeah, let's drop that in. Yeah. Now I'm just going to keep a close eye on my audio here, because this bloody thing keeps coming and going. Anyway, right, but yeah, a wee bit of the loop in there. Let's see how this works. All at a time and everything. Let's line that up, make sure it's indeed in time. Strangely enough, that loop seems to start on the offbeat. How bizarre, as the song says. So all I need to do is make sure that starts on the beat. Listen to it on its own. Yeah, that's come in a wee bit out of time, that sample. Sometimes it does that if you're dropping in a sample, and it can affect the sample rate. I'm not even gonna bother checking it at the moment. I just wanna crack on with it. See what our tops have got here. That's quite cool. I like that. Hopefully it's the same key. Yeah, that's nice, man. That gives that a good bit of swing. I'm glad that one worked. Normally I'd be here for a bit, you know, 10 minutes making sure everything was working. Anyway, there we go. Yeah. So a wee bit cluttered at the moment. This is the thing as well. The more loops you drop out of the track, the more clutter it gets. So some of these kind of wee guitar parts like this kind of one up the top here. This can go for at the moment. Okay. This is quite... Quite a busy loop that. Maybe if I take off a lot of the bass, it'll fit in better as well. Because the moment it's taking up quite a lot of space in the mix. Okay, so let's see how that sits. Yeah, not bad. You can probably put a bit more bass back in it. Yeah. So we'll leave out that kind of snare sound at the moment, we don't need that. But I want to see how it works with the bass. How does this interact with the bass, I wonder? Let's uh, check it out. Another thing you got to watch as well, you got a lot of bass on the actual bass and a lot of bass in the bass drum. One of them, you know, you're going to have to make way for one. Often what I do, a good idea sometimes with the bass is to sidechain compress it. What that involves is the bass ducking. Every time the bass drum hits, it ducks slightly because both of the bass and the bass drum are fighting for position in the lower end. Think of it as a piano. If you hit two keys down the bottom of the piano, down the left-hand side, it gets a bit cluttered down there. Bass likes to be on its own. Bass is quite a lonely sound that has to be on its own or at least it has to be kind of plugging in around something in the case of bass and the bass drum often you want them to kind of work around each other so if i've got a bass drum 
It's basically banging throughout. That bass drum there. I'm going to do something called side chain compress. So I'm going to send that bass drum to a bus here. The bus I'm not going to use. Let me call it, just call it a chain. So this is effectively the insert, or should I say the send on that bass drum channel is sent to bus 5. Okay, bus 5. It's just the bass drum, okay? But what I'm going to then do on this bass, I'm going to put the compressor that's on that bass channel, I'm going to run this side chain. Okay, here we go. Side chain. Detection, max, there we go. So this side chain, if I just get this accurate here. We want to basically side chain that to the base. So some max. Then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 boom. Yes, indeed. Let's get a side chain bass. Yeah, okay. No, it's been putting our compressor. I must confess that I've loaded that up, and I don't have a fucking clue how to do it on Logic 10. In short, what I was going to do there is basically side chain the bass drum to the base. Now, this is not a program that I normally work in, let's say. I normally work in the older version of Logic. But give me just a second. I'm not going to freak out. I'm going to find out. Yeah. So basically, the side chain will work around the bass drum whenever I can find the bloody thing. Come back to that in a wee minute. Right. Loops. Onto the mixer. Let's see what's happening here. Yeah. Yes, there we go. So, there we go. yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, I think what I'm going to do actually, I'm going to come back to this because. Quite a lot involved in getting this off the ground. Also, I must confess, a couple of wee things to iron out with Logic Pro as well. But in short, right, so basically what we've done so far, we've got two different riffs. We're going to use the one in the main riff. That's our main riff. Yeah. And then... Yeah. Yes, indeed. So that's pretty good progress so far. I mean, that's all an hour and a half's work there. What we've got is ultimately the structure for using for a kind of funky house track. All that stuff was played live in bass and guitar. 
by myself. And what we're going to do, I think we'll go on with next week, is actually adding in the rest of the instrumentation in this track. When I say the rest of the instrumentation, we've got some loops in there, got some basic drum sounds, but what I want to get in is really kind of the arrangement, okay? That'd be a case of building it up every eight bars as you do in any good house song, okay? So at the moment, the two main riffs, like I say, song like Daft Punk's Around the World, classic example, it's only two bass riffs and everything else is added on top of that. It's what I call the bells and whistles. But that there is the meat and potatoes of the track. So what we're going to do next week is continue on with that track. So guys, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Say yo one more time. Who is out there in the stratospheres? Say yo! Yes, indeed. So, thanks very much for tuning in, guys. Now, like I say, every week, 8pm, now I do have an album coming out shortly on Play Records, which is going to be a big deal, man. It's going to be a lot of that funk house stuff, stuff like you heard there. Check us out on hotknifeshouse.com, okay? www.hotknifeshouse.com, like I say, you can go on there. I've got likes to my Facebook, to Instagram. I've also got a lot of mixes as well. That I've done on Mixcloud, stuff that we can ultimately put across, and um, stuff that actually has a lot of Hot Knife tracks that you wouldn't have heard before, because often I try them out on that Hot Knife's House radio show, but like I say, I'm just about to kind of check out here, so let's see, who can we, who can we raid, who is doing music production, I'm just going to have a wee look here on my... Why does this guy always come up? There's a guy here with <laughs> a guy that has. Yeah, this guy here. Who is this guy? This guy's hilarious. <laughs> Be happy with 8th Radio. I don't know. I think this is complete, absolute nonsense. So, yeah, this is the kind of stuff I'd watch for a laugh in the meantime. So, I tell you what, I'm going to raid this channel, actually. Here we go. See if I can do it right. There we go. So there's there's some fantastic, some fantastic. Uh... <laughs> Accordion music for you. Anyway, thanks very much, guys. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week, eight o'clock, and we are going to finish with that track. Okay. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful. Cheers now. Bye bye. Love you.